Welcome back. Today I am with the 1966 MG MGB. Last time I got the car running, but today I'd like to do some upgrades to make it a little more reliable. If you remember last time, I already upgraded the starter to a modern high torque starter. And today I'm going to start with an upgrade that I think everyone that has an MGB should do. And that's one of these modern oil filter adapter kits. This allows you to change from the canister type oil filter to using one of these modern filters. The reason I recommend this is if you're not changing your oil often enough because you either think changing these canister styles is hard or you're scared that it may leak after you mess with it, if you have this type of filter on it, you're probably going to do your oil filter more frequently and as often as you should be. Spinning one of these off, throwing it in the trash, and screwing a new one on is so much quicker and easier than dealing with these old canister style, and there's a lot fewer places for this to leak. So I do recommend if you are driving your MGB, just go ahead and do this conversion. It's totally reversible. Just take your canister parts, put them in a box, and save them for later. I don't think anybody is going to fault you for using a more modern and better oil filter. Before I put the car up in the air to get the oil filter off, I'm going to remove this line here, which goes to the oil cooler. And that's because I won't be taking just the oil filter off. I'll also be taking off this adapter for the line for the oil cooler and replacing both of them. You need a one inch wrench to get this loose. Now that that hose is removed, I'll get the car up in the air. Now that we're under the car, just in front of the starter, this black canister is the oil filter. It comes off with just the one bolt on the bottom. Right now I've only removed the oil filter canister. I also have to remove this oil filter adapter that has the fitting for the oil cooler on it. And that should just pull right off. It's only held on because it's been on there for so long. Now if we look up here, there's a groove right here that goes all the way around and there's a rubber O-ring in there. We need to get that out and replace it. Now this could be old. This one feels pretty soft, but if it's old and hard, it, it, it'll break apart and come out in a lot of little pieces. But you need to make sure that you get that, that out of there. And this is the only time that you will have to be dealing with the seal again. But you need to make sure that you get this right the first time. There we go. Looks like I got lucky this time. It came out easily in one piece. Let's take a look at what comes in the kit. We have some instructions. This is the oil filter adapter itself. The filter will go on that side. Looks like we have a few parts in there. We have a new seal, and we do have some copper washers. This would be used for the banjo type fittings to the oil cooler. We won't be using those. We're gonna put the new O-ring on there. I put some grease on it to help hold it up there. So once I push that in, the grease should hold that in place. Now I can take the new adapter. So we have the pieces together in this order. We have our adapter, an extension, a locking washer, and then the spin on filter adapter. I think I'm going to put a little extra step into this. I'm going to go back up top and I'm going to connect my hose to this. That way this is oriented exactly the way I want it before I tighten this down. I now have the oil pipe connected. You can't really see it going up through there, but now it's time to tighten this down. For this next step, this gets torqued to 12 foot pounds. So I have my torque wrench set to 12. You don't want this any less or any more than this or it will leak. I'm using a one inch socket again. Now we wouldn't want that coming undone and dumping our oil everywhere. So we need to bend that lock tab out, which is going to prevent that nut from spinning. I have it pressed against the flats on this side. So that should be good. 
with the type of lift I am using, it's a little bit hard to see up in there, but I did make a little mistake. There's a little ear coming off of that locking tab and there's two circles there. That will actually hold that in place. And then you see I have locked the outside of that lock tab against the bolt. Now both the lock washer and the bolt are held in place so they cannot move. Now just use a little bit of the oil that you will have all over yourself by now. Put it on the end of your oil filter and get that spun on. Never use any tools to install your oil filter. You just want these hand tight. Now at this point, you can start your car up, check for oil leaks, and then shut it back down. The oil filter is going to fill with oil. So after you turn it off, check your oil again and add the appropriate amount. Everything looks okay. I can shut it off again. It's just below the minimum level, so I'm going to put one quart in. I think one of the next reliability upgrades you would want to do on an MGB is to replace this old generator with an alternator. Depending on what year your MGB is, this will also mean that you need to convert it to negative ground. And there are some reasons that you want to do that anyways. If you convert your car to negative ground, you can run a modern stereo like this one already is. All of the lights on your car will be much brighter, especially at idle. And you will have cheaper and more options available for ignition upgrades. This is the kit that I bought for the alternator. Let's see what we get. So this is the same kit you would use on an MGA. We have the alternator itself. Came with some brackets. All the bolts and connectors we'll need. And it even came with a new belt. I'm going to disconnect the battery and take the generator out. And then I'll show you what the brackets look like that held the generator in that we need to remove and replace with different ones for the alternator. If we hold the alternator up where the generator was, you can see that we are going to be using the same front bracket, but the rear bracket is way back here. You could of course make spacers for that, but the kit comes with a new bracket that will take away that gap. So we will be taking this bracket off and replacing it with this one that brings this tab way over to here. Now with that new bracket in place and the alternator mocked up, you can see that the alternator is going to be hitting the bracket for the ignition coil. So we're going to have to relocate the ignition coil up further onto the fender. It's just three bolts on the motor mount to remove the bracket for the ignition coil. So I'm going to take the bracket off, put those bolts back in, and then I can unbolt the ignition coil from the bracket and remount the ignition coil on the fender. This is where I have chosen to put the ignition coil where I think it is out of the way of everything. And this also leaves the wires long enough to still get to the distributor and the alternator. From that point, the alternator just bolts up like a standard generator. Now I need to change the wiring at the regulator before we hook this up. For the next step, we need to wire the alternator up. And I am not a fan of the instructions that Moss has sent with this kit. One of the problems is there's so much information here because this is covering both MGAs and MGBs and things are also maybe going to be a little different on your car than how it's described here. And I don't think it's described very well. So this is the diagrams that they give you. And I don't know why they give you four diagrams to work through what you're supposed to do. And I also don't like the way that they did it. What they would like you to do is basically take all of your wires off of the regulator. Then you can take the regulator out and you will have to permanently cut the ends off of your wires to attach them together in the way that they want you to do it here. So I'm going to show you how to do it more simply and in a way that's also reversible. So down here, these are the two wires that originally went to the generator and they do want you to reuse these wires. I am going to reuse one of them, but not the other. This big one is where all of the power flows through and they want you to cut the other end of this off so that you can tie it together with a bunch of other wires. But instead, I have made a completely new wire, this red one that plugs into the back of the alternator and then just goes into the battery connection at the solenoid. That way there is a straight path right to charging the battery. When I'm done with this installation, I can either remove this wire and save it for later or I can just tie it up out of the way. I am going to reuse this wire that is the brown and green wire, however, so I can plug that into the small terminal on the alternator. 
And then over here on the regulator, instead of disconnecting all of these wires and then cutting the ends off and splicing them together, I'm just going to remove the brown and yellow wire, which is the other end of the wire that is now attached to the alternator, and the one next to it, the brown and green wire. That is the wire that goes up to your ignition light. And all we need to do is make a tiny jumper that connects those two wires together, and then we're done. So both of these wires have spade terminals or slide terminals. I just need to make a short jumper wire to connect these two together. And all the rest of these wires we can leave on the regulator, and they will still work just fine. Here's my little jumper. Once I put this in, the alternator install is done. There's the little jumper in place. I'll just tuck that back and let's test the alternator. Currently the battery voltage is at 12.42 volts. Let's start the engine and see what it goes up to. The engine's running now, the voltage is going up. If I rev the engine up a little bit, it should go up even faster. Looks like it was settling in around 14.3 volts. That's exactly what we want. My last must-have reliability upgrade is a new Pertronix distributor. Yes, for less money than this new distributor, I could order just a Pertronix unit and put it in the existing distributor, but that distributor is probably all worn out, and putting a Pertronix unit inside of a worn-out distributor will never be as accurate as replacing it with a brand new distributor. In preparation for the new distributor, we want to do a couple things. These aren't really necessary but this is going to save you a lot of time if something goes wrong. So our cylinder one is right here and on our cap that is up here in this corner. See this wire right here where it goes. So we want to remove the cap and then we want to try to get our rotor till it's pointing somewhere close to that one position. And you can do that by just putting it in gear and then pushing it and the distributor will rotate. Once you have that rotor generally pointing towards the number one cylinder, we now need to go to our timing marks. I've colored in the timing marks both on the pulley and top dead center, so I want to rotate the engine now until the yellow line matches up with the yellow triangle. So with the car in gear, I'm just going to roll it until the two of those match up. And there we go. We should be on top dead center on the compression stroke now. Now we can take a look at the position of the rotor. And when we insert our new distributor, we want to make sure that that rotor is pointing that in that direction if possible. If when we install the new distributor, that rotor is facing a different direction, we are going to have to reclock our distributor cap so that number one is in a different quadrant on the cap than it is right now. So let's install the new distributor and see where the rotor ends up. We just need to slide the vacuum line off the top. And then we can undo the clamp down here and pull the distributor out. This one is held in there pretty tight, so I'm going to give the clamp a couple little taps. Let's see if that spread the clamp out better. There we go. Comes out just like that. Now on the end of the distributor, this might look symmetric, but it's actually not. This pin is offset to one side, so this distributor actually only goes in one way. So if you were to remove this, it's actually quite easy to get it back in the right spot. The only part that you can screw up is how much you rotate the actual body of the distributor, but usually it's going to get you pretty close as long as you remembered where your vacuum was coming out before. I'm going to put a little bit of grease around the O-ring on the new distributor. Now let's slide it in and see where the rotor comes out. It's only going to go so far until we turn the rotor till it winds up inside there. And then it will go down the rest of the way. So it looks like our rotor is pointing in the correct direction. So now we just need to turn the cap until our number one wire looks to be in about the same place that it was before. 
I have the caps back on both distributors now. This one over here, this is the distributor that was in the car and it was sitting about this angle right here. So we can take a look at where the number one cylinder wire is and I want to rotate the new distributor until that's at about the same exact angle that this one is. And then that will be our starting point. So I think I need to go a little bit Maybe a little bit like that. We'll call that a good starting point. Now I can move the old spark plug wires from the old cap over to the new cap, and then we'll finish up that wiring. Off of the new Protronix distributor, we have a black wire and a red wire. The black wire goes to the negative side of the coil, and the red wire goes to the positive side of the coil. That makes this installation pretty simple. This is the negative terminal of the coil, so the other side is the positive. So black will connect right here, red on the other side. Wiring is all now hooked up. You can see the purple terminals on the coil. So we have the black wire running to the negative side of the coil, the red wire running to the positive side of the coil, and then the other wire that is also connected to the positive side of the coil, that is our power coming from the ignition switch. The distributor is not fully clamped down. I can still rotate it but it is held enough that it's not going to turn on its own. Let's start the engine up and then get a timing light on it and get this set exactly where it should be. I have the engine running and my timing light hooked up. Let's take a look. It's going to be a bit hard to see because the frame rate of the camera may not be showing the stroke effect of the timing light. But right now, our yellow line and our yellow triangle line up, I need to turn the distributor until the yellow line is lined up with the third triangle. It's hard to see, but our timing mark now lines up with the third triangle. So our timing is set to 10 degrees, exactly where we should be. Now that the timing is set, I can re-tighten the clamp down here so that the distributor cannot turn anymore. And then I'm going to take a look at my idle speed and adjust it if necessary when you're changing the timing on your engine that may affect the idle speed. So you may need to adjust that. And besides that, I think we're done here.